Good evening and welcome to Conversations Live, Get Your Garden On. I'm Patty Satalia. May marks the official start of gardening season and all the work that comes with it. Tonight our experts will provide tips to help get you off to a good start. They'll also take your questions. Our toll-free number is 1-800-543-8242 and our email address is connect at wpsu.org. If you'd like to join us on Twitter, you can tweet a question to at WPSU. Now let's meet our guests, Tom Butzler is a Penn State Extension horticulture educator. He works with commercial horticulture operations and the landscaping community. His area of expertise is vegetable production and beekeeping. Mike Orzelek is a professor of vegetable crops in the Department of Horticulture at Penn State. He's also the director of the Penn State Center for Plasticulture. Among other things, he's an expert on plastic mulches, high tunnels, weed management, and tillage systems. Steve Bogash is a Penn State Extension horticulture educator. He specializes in in vegetables, small fruit, cut flowers, and greenhouse growing. And I think we have most of the bases covered, so thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank Good you. to be here. Steve, you're involved in Penn State's trial gardens, and, and if anyone noticed, they're no longer at University Park. They're now at Landisville, uh, Pennsylvania. Give us a, an idea of what's new or interesting in terms of uh, vegetables. What are you learning? Well, this year, probably the most exciting thing is we're looking at day-neutral strawberries in containers, something that's really easy for um, regular gardeners to do. There's two varieties that we're really excited about, Albion and Seascape, and these have the potential to give you uh, strawberries not only here in the, in the spring, but some all season wrong, long and then a real spike of them in the fall. So that's probably one of the most exciting things we're doing. And a lot of people probably heard an NPR story saying that, uh, mm. uh, that, that growers have... Uh, refined ways to make strawberries bigger, re more red, and, and firmer, but they're losing a little bit of their sweetness. How, how are these working out in terms of sweetness? You still can't beat a locally grown strawberry when you can ripen it all the way before you ship it. And that's why Pennsylvania strawberries taste so great. We get to eat them right here. You pick them at the peak of ripeness. I, I've never found them lacking in sweetness. Okay, now you mentioned day neutral. What exactly does that mean? Well, strawberries typically, we're all used to June bearing strawberries where they come in in the springtime. Now, they're good for about three or four weeks and then strawberries are gone. Day neutrals, they start blooming now. They'll give you a nice load of fruit now, some all summer long. And then again, like I said, this spike in the fall, they just are not governed by how long the days are. Okay, the name of them again, because I think some people... Day remember. neutral. Okay, right. that's the name, no, but the name of the... Of right. the oh, Albion variety. and Albion Seascape. and Seascape. Yeah, okay. two we're very excited about. Okay, lawn care, Tom. We didn't mention you, you're also an expert on lawn care, but we're running out of time to do certain things like uh, fertilize. Yeah, uh, most of the grasses we grow in Pennsylvania are what we call cool season grasses. Uh, they grow in the spring and the fall. Uh, during the summer months, uh, they go somewhat dormant. They're not growing vigorously. And so management uh, of these cool season grasses typically take place in, in the spring and the fall. So, uh, you know, by mid-June, typically, we start running into dry periods, warmer climate, and uh, things are a little, a little different uh, with our cool season grasses. So if you want to fertilize... Get it done now. Yeah. Of course, yep. you, uh, Mike Orzelak is saying, why would you fertilize? It just means you have to mow the grass more often. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so Mike, for you, what are top priorities in terms of things people ought to be doing in the garden right now? I think a couple of things they should really be doing is first doing a soil test because we have people calling up and saying, well, my plants aren't growing very well, and it turns out that they have either high pH, low pH, or, inf or, or uh, imbalance in nutrients. And to take a soil test, that helps to reduce the problems. Secondly, they need to really plan for watering. I have too many people who are growing onions, tomatoes, peppers, et cetera, and they say, well, my plants look yellow at the end. And I say, when, how, much, how often are you watering? Well, we're waiting for it until it rains. Well, if you don't get rain for six weeks, you got a problem. So I think if you make plans to water, it'd be really critical. And once a week, twice a week, or does it depend on I'd say at least once a week, okay. inch, inch, inch a week probably at the, at the very best, or at least. And then I think the third thing, which is going to be critical this year, is that all homeowners who are growing tomatoes and peppers, I mean tomatoes and potatoes, be alert on uh, late blight uh, symptoms in their plants because we feel, I was talking to Beth Gugino, the plant pathologist today, and she feels that late blight's going to be very serious this year. And in many cases, it happens in the home garden before it gets to commercial fields. Oh. 
So I would like to encourage homeowners to really look out for late blight symptoms on tomatoes and potatoes this year. If they see it in their gardens, what should they do? Send Pull the plants the, out? Call the extension educator in the county and or send it to the plant disease clinic. Okay. For now you, you mentioned soil tests, and, and these can be done in your local extension office. We're going to put a graphic up to show people Good. that there are extension offices throughout the state. Right. If you did a soil test last year, do you need one again this year? How often? I would do you say I'd like to see one every two years at least. So if they did one last year, I'd go with what we had last year. But if they didn't do it for two or three years, I'd want to have one this year. Okay. All right. We go to our first phone call. We've got Jerry on the line. He's calling us from State College. Go ahead, please, Jerry. Hi. Thank you very much. Um, I use a weed and feed in the springtime for lawn care uh, for broadleaf weeds and dandelions and things like that. Uh, what kind of fertilizer should I use again in the fall? Well, uh, I think the, the first thing you need to be aware of is probably, not probably, but Mike mentioned take a soil test. Typically our soil tests or our soil tests do not test for nitrogen. They do test for phosphorus and potassium. If you're adding fertilizer every year, your phosphorus and potassium levels probably are are okay, they're pretty good. So the only thing you might need to do is add some nitrogen. And typically with our cool season grasses, depending on what uh, cool season grass you grow, anywhere from two pounds to I think about four pounds of nitrogen uh, per year. And what you do is you divvy that up into two, three, four applications. So, um, you know, have you done a soil test recently, per, Jerry? Two to four pounds per, per thousand, thousand square meters. feet. Per thousand square feet, that is oh, okay. correct. Have you done a soil test lately? Um, not for about five years. Okay, mm. so that, it, it would be a very good uh, time to take a soil test. Um, not only does it tell you the nutrient level, but uh, the uh, pH of your soil. And our turf grass, uh, in, in order to get that vigorous stand, uh, I think about a 6.2 to a uh, 6.8 pH. And over time, our soils tend to be or go acidic, so it might be a good time to do that soil test and see what your pH is. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for your phone call. We go to Curtis, who's calling us from Spring Mills. You're on the air, Curtis. Yes, hi. Thanks for taking my call. I'm calling about blueberries. Um, my blueberry plants tend to produce an overabundance of berries and very few leaves, and then um, the plants. You mean flowers, I think. Die. Pardon? Uh, do you mean an overabundance of flowers? Uh, flowers and then fruit and virtually no leaves, and then they die. Mm. That's, pretty, that's pretty common with blueberries. Um, Here's the secret to blueberries. If you get the pH of your soil right, everything goes well with blueberries. If the pH of your soil is off, then almost anything that you do is not going to work out well, real well. Blueberries are ericaceous plants. They're acid lovers. So you're looking for a pH between 4.5 and 5. The pH scale is logarithmic, and I hate to take people back to that terrible part of high school math, but it means that the scale moves very quickly. So if your pH is 6, that's 10 times too alkaline than a pH of 5. So little differences in the pH scale make a really big difference. Best thing to do is we're back to soil testing yeah. again, and blueberries are just so incredibly sensitive to the mm -hmm. pH that you have. And my guess is if you're not seeing a lot of foliar growth and you've been fertilizing it with ammonium nitrate or aluminum nitrate, probably what you've got is an elevated pH, and you're gonna have to get that down, probably using some ferrous sulfate, certainly using the right kind of mulches over the season, but start off with a soil test. My bet is from what you're describing, it's just gotten too high. Th this sounds also like something that you have to keep at every year. If, yeah. you, if your soil naturally is not uh, acidic enough for blueberries. Blueberries like it wherever rhododendrons, azaleas, wild blueberries, and related plants grow. If you're a flatlander and you're trying to grow blueberries, you have an uphill battle trying to keep the pH right, and it's something you have to work on all the time. Um, do you know what the pH of your soil is? Oh, we lost, we lost no, the call. Sorry. We lost the caller. Uh, here, here's uh, an email that we got after our last program in April, so I'll just read this question. I have a purple smoke bush about 10 years old. It <laughs> appears healthy and strong with good annual leaf production. It blossoms in early spring, within, but within several weeks the blossoms wilt and does not produce the heavy smoke look that this uh, ornamental is known for. I've tried a variety of fertilizers, fungicides to no avail. I thought perhaps it was late frost, but last year it bloomed well and it was a 
warm spring. Neighbors with the same ornamental had a nice blossom and smoke look all summer. Uh, is time to give up on this and accept that it's not going to have a sustained blossom? Maybe I have a blossom virus. Maybe it's time to talk to the neighbor and see what, <laughs> what they're, they're doing, doing and right. just do the same exact thing. You know, uh, the one thing that kind of stands out there is the fertilizer mm -hmm. um, point that he made. And you kind of wonder maybe if he's overdoing it on the fertilizer and pushing the vegetative growth uh, at the expense of the reproductive growth or the flowers. So, And, in fact, these smoke trees don't, they can live in, in uh Poor soil. Right, yeah, that might be another thing. You don't know what kind of soil characteristics he has. Maybe it's in a, a rich soil and it's, you know, it's got a lot of nutrients in it and so it's really lush and you know, at the expense of uh, the blossoms. And we're missing information. Is this in the shade? This is a full yeah. sun plant. If it's not getting exposed to full sun, it's not going to perform properly. Okay, this question from uh, Patty in Bedford County. Our new property is bordered by forest and uh, she's concerned about the hemlock problems, the insect problems. We're looking for someone who can advise us on the care and eminence of our property. I'm not sure exactly what they mean by that, um, but, they're, but they're worried about this, this hemlock disease that we're, this white powdery. Well, it's, it's, it's not so much a disease as it is an insect, insect. the hemlock woolly adelgid. And pro you know, the best thing to do is to maybe go into the yellow pages and, and um, pull up maybe, not maybe, but pull up one of the certified uh, arborists, someone that does tree care, uh, that has gone under, undergone some training. So that would be my best suggestion there. Yeah. Okay. We go now to Fred, who's calling us from Smithport or Somerset. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Please, Matt. Uh, oh. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for putting me on. Uh, the, uh, one of your gentlemen... I uh, guess there was saying to watch out for the blight on the tomatoes and po uh, potatoes, mm -hmm. but I don't know what blight looks like. And also, I had a second question, if I may. You may. And uh, that was, uh, I put a fish in a bucket, a five-gallon bucket with dirt in it, and I have a basil plant growing in it. I was wondering if that's safe to eat that way. Did you say you put a fish <laughs> in the bucket? <laughs> Yes, uh, it's a trout. Somebody, my neighbor <laughs> gave it to me, and I put the whole trout in the very bottom of the bucket. I filled it up with organic soil, and then I planted the uh, the basil plant, and it's growing. But I then I started worrying about what might happen if uh, somebody eats that. Th this is a dead trout, I assume, not a live trout. <laughs> well, I guess we're oh, wondering yeah. why you didn't eat that trout. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, somebody said that our lake up here has uh, mercury in it, and he didn't want to eat it, and I. I I never touched a dead fish in my life, but I just put it in the dirt. <laughs> I just cannot imagine that the basil would not be safe to eat. I mean, over oh, time, that fish that. is okay. going to break down. And, right. you know, the, the, it, even if it is loaded with mercury, it's for the plant to take it up and then move it to where I, I think you're on real safe ground with the basil. I'll turn it over to Mike. He can, he can finish up with the blight. Yeah, well, the uh, late blight. blight, the symptoms are you get this water-soaked appearance on the leaf. In, uh, it can start uh, almost any place in the plant, but generally starts uh, on the younger leaves and works its way down. Water yeah. soaked. Explain what that, that looks like. <laughs> well, it looks like it's, uh, it, it was, uh, water was on the leaf and then it turned black because of the uh, organism that's in there. And say so if this black lesion or black appearance on the leaves, and they're not a distinctive circular. This could be irregular shapes on a leaf. And the problem is that once you get, if you see that, you need to get a, a verification that it is late blight because late blight can take a plant down within two weeks. I mean, you go from a healthy plant to nothing in two weeks. And with the weather we've been having in Pennsylvania the last couple of years, I'm really concerned that the homeowners will lose a lot of tomatoes and potatoes this year. But you said earlier that, that what's happening in the home garden is spreading to the commercial operations. Mm -hmm. So what is it that you want homeowners to do if they do end up with, with early to, blight? To, to notify at least the extension educator in the county and that extension educator will contact Beth Gagina Hotel, who will then t relay information to growers to make sure commercial growers are putting on fungicide sprays on a weekly basis. Okay. And, and the extent of the level of the infestation we're going to see in Pennsylvania this year. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Fred, for your phone call. Uh, we go to an email, this one from Larry in Port Matilda. Uh, he wants to know, he says, lichen is overtaking my hemlock shrubbery. The hemlocks are over 80 years old, although the heavily trimmed hemlocks have been untrimmed for over a year. The most heavily affected are still in trouble. Is there any remedy? I think that one's yours, Tom. Um, Me too. Okay. <laughs> um, well, lichen is a, um, it, it's, it's two organisms living together in a symbiotic relationship. It's a fungal body and, and an algae body, and they, they work together to survive. 
Um, it's not doing anything to the tree. Um, it's not extracting nutrients. It's not what we call a parasite. Uh, typically, you see lichen on things that are stressed or in, in, in a, a rock or a limb that has fallen down. Healthy trees that are grown vigorously, you don't see a lot of lichen on. So it may be the tree has just reached a, an age where it's kind of maturing out and this lichen has taken hold, but it, it's not doing anything to the tree. Okay. All right, we go to Maggie, who's calling us from Williamsport. You're on the air, Maggie. <clears throat> How can I keep the crows away from my tomato plants? Every time I get a nice green tomato on it, the birds eat it. That's an excellent to, question. I'm going to hang up because I want to hear the answer. <laughs> oh, well, good. That's an excellent question. Okay. And um, Son with a slingshot? Yeah, we, we have constant <laughs> problems with, uh, with birds in our tomato research trials as well. The single best way that is least intrusive is to put netting over top of your mm -hmm. plants. Since you're going to be trellising your tomatoes somehow, anyhow, um, get bird netting, drape it over. Mm -hmm. It's a pain to work in, I know, because you've got to pull the netting up every time you want to do something, but it's the only good way. And make sure that you take the netting all the way down to the ground and weight it down or use some staples or something to hold it down because if, if you don't, um, certain birds and um, robins are like the genius of the bird world. So you may be able to get rid of the blackbirds, starlings, etc. but robins will jump along on the ground. They'll hop along and go up underneath and you won't know why you're missing tomatoes because they'll do it all in the hours that you're not around. So make sure you, when you use the netting, you take it down all the way. It's nice, it's chemical free, it'll give you complete control, but don't be surprised that if they don't get to some of the tomatoes that are right at the edge of the netting, they're very, very resourceful and they will go after tomatoes they can get to. Now, hmm. now Steve, you mentioned uh, supporting your tomatoes with trellises. Mm. There are so many ways out there, there uh, that, that you can use to support your tomatoes. Uh, I know in my garden I've tried most of them and it still ends up looking like, looking like a tomato jungle. Everything sure. falls over. What's the best way to do this? Um, well, let's start off with the worst way. The, um, the, the triangular cages or the conical cages that you find at so many garden centers, the lightweight ones, they're really good for container grown tomatoes. They don't have much use in the garden because as you say, they fall over. Um, in our home garden, we use hog panels. These are fencing panels that you can find at every tractor supply place. And we actually espalier, we train our tomatoes flat onto these panels. I say we, my wife does all this work, but <laughs> I put the panels up, I plant them, she trains them on Deep there. Work. Yeah, so, so we do ours flat. Um, in some of our trial patches, we actually use concrete reinforcing wire cages where we take six feet of concrete reinforcing wire, the same stuff you use down when you pour concrete to support it, make them into a circle, cut one ring off. They work much better than most other cages, but in all production, um, you see Florida weave done, yeah. which is every two plants have a stake. You take strings around the plants like this, but if you go online, and you uh, Google or Bing Florida Weave, there's excellent diagrams online. Okay, but, 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 but another thing I want to jump in here and say that you're talking about indeterminate plants versus determinate. And if you're growing into indeterminates, you have to have trellising because some of these guys mm -hmm. will go 8, it, 10 it, feet it, tall. Explain indeterminate for some Indeterminate is a plant which keeps on putting meristematic tissue on top. So you get young tissue growing, you get flowers, leaves, more flowers, leaves, and it go forever. It could be 18 feet tall. Determinant is that they set a certain number of flowers and leaves, they stop growing. So usually determinant plants are about maybe three to four feet tall at the most. Indeterminants can be as 18 feet tall. So uh, I've grown uh, indeter or determinant plants on poly without any trellising at all because they're smaller and they don't take up as much room. So I think really if you, if you think about what you're growing, if it's indeterminate, you better have a trellis. If you don't have an a, a indeterminate a determinate plant, you may want to try it without trellis. And we see a lot advertised, you know, these uh, container plants, tomatoes growing from Up, the bottom of up, a... Upside down. Upside down. Yeah. What it's a gimmick. I mean, it's a gimmick. I mean, if you want to buy it, try it. Fine. But I, it I works. Have no problem. It, it actually I know it works. works. I mean, what, it, the, your your fruit isn't lying in the laying in the dirt. One of one, one of one of my very good client cooperators destroyed his wife's clothesline. He took fifty <laughs> plaster buckets, hung them from his wife's clothesline, put irrigation oh, up, and had all of these tomato plants hanging down. Each one probably went fifty to sixty pounds by the end of the season. He had two by fours in every direction, <laughs> but it worked. The topsy turvy plant. I don't know if that's patented or not, but does it work? It, there were lots and lots of fruit hanging down there. <laughs> okay. I, think, I think the only concern is you have high winds, storms. That's a problem. 
Okay. We go to Charlie, who's <clears throat> calling us from State College. Go ahead, please, Charlie. Hi. I've been growing goat chili peppers indoors for about six months now. The plants are growing, growing well, but the flowers keep falling off. I recently moved them outside uh, now that the weather is warm. And I just want to know what I can do to uh, get them to fruit. I, I, what crop did he say? I he said, he said chili, uh, chili peppers. Chili peppers. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to guess that the reason that you were having so much problem with them is they were getting <laughs> short on sunlight. Um, and that's probably why they were starting to toss blossoms. So getting them outside is going to be helpful. Um, it's a really good time to start getting plants out right now. Our nights are not cold enough to do any damage to them. It's going to take, if they're all indoors, it's going to take them a week or so to harden back off. But once they get going again, you fertilize them, they should go right back into flowering again. All right. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm sorry. You had, you had something else, Charlie? I know that's it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, this email from Sandra. <clears throat> I have young cantaloupe plants that were started from seeds and grown indoors under full spectrum plant lights. They are now in flats, flats outdoors, hardening off. They have grown into vines that are two to three feet long, which will make it difficult to transplant. They're shaking their heads uh, into the vegetable <laughs> garden. The question is if I cut these plants back to about 12 inches when I transplant them, can they continue to thrive from this point on? I would say from my experience, uh, she might be, have a chance to cut it back, but if she does that, she'll have to put on some plant growth regulators, which will actually uh, go ahead and increase levels of auxins. The three main regulators are auxins, cytokinins, and gibberellins. And if you don't have the auxins in a plant, you don't get root development. And in the roots, that's where the gibberellins and cytokinins are produced. So the three of those together will actually enhance plant development. But at the stage she's talking about right now, we never plant a plant maybe older than 28 days. Yep. So and her so, problem is she planted these indoors too early. Right, and it's very old now. So she may be able to recoup it, but part, I would think right now they're so old, they may not want to come back and rejuvenate. Unless, even if you use some of the plant growth regulators, she may not have she, success. She may be better off just planting the seed directly into her garden exactly, at this point. Exactly, yeah, at this yeah, point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate her excitement in wanting to get started early. A little too early. A little too early. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I wanted to talk with you, Mike, about weeding and mulching because these are two things that we're all, I think, all gardeners are concerned about. Let's first, first weeding. Well, the, you know, the weeding, there people talk about herbicides, but there's so many other ways you can weed. Uh, certainly using uh, plastic <laughs> mulch, uh, using the uh, weed barrier type material, using paper, using straw, uh, all work rather well. The, probably the first thing is you want to identify areas in your yard where there's very few weeds growing. And the biggest thing we see over time is that people do not try to uh, selectively remove weeds as they go to flower and they produce seeds. And if you don't remove weeds that have seeds in them, you're going to increase the weed seed bank in that soil area. And, and we've seen people who actually are very successful in reducing weed populations by removing weeds as they produce. Before, before they the seeds. dandelion, for example, right, is, right. So looks that like would be, cotton you know, seed. One thing I think is critical. You know, hoeing is another thing you can do. Uh, actually, there's also um, potential to do uh, propane burning and burn uh, weeds down. If you have upright plants, like tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, you can come and burn the weeds around them. If you have things like candle, cucumbers, watermelon, it's more difficult because you can kill some of the plant as well as kill a weed. So, But that beats pesticides, doesn't it? It beats pesticides. And actually, the other thing which we've fooled around with here lately is, uh, is uh, high-test vinegar. Mm -hmm. And you yeah. get the higher percentage of acetic acid and vinegar. And if you spray your weeds with that, it actually will kill the weeds over time. But you don't want to spray your crop because the uh, same thing will happen to the crop that happens to the weed. It'll right. desiccate it. Okay, and you mentioned uh, mulch. How important is color? What difference does color of mulch, uh, plastic, plastic mulch, mulch <laughs> rather, make? Well, I mean, the difference is going to be in really soil temperature. And so if you get things like a red, blue, clear, they tend to be the highest uh, temperatures in the soil. They'll produce temperatures probably in the 75, 80 degree range. If you're going to use um, white and reflective silver, it's cooler. So you might lose 10 degrees uh, between uh, the red, blue, and then the silver and uh, white. Mm -hmm. So if you're in the south, you may want to use white. If you're in the north, you may want to use the colored. I noticed that some people use a, a plastic mulch that looks like wood bark. How effective is that? I mean, you've seen it plastic. You've never seen that? <laughs> you mean the, <laughs> for in the garden? Uh, for, the no, rubber? No, the rubber. Around oh, the, the tree. Oh, the tires. Tires. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that, that probably is a good way to reduce weed uh, problems in the garden with the shredded tires. I mean, um, 
the only concern is hopefully they don't try to incorporate that in the fall after right, it's done. Right, because this isn't something that's right. going to break down. down. Yeah. It doesn't okay. break down. So, But it's a very nice, attractive product once you put it in the garden. Okay. If you're just joining <clears throat> us, I'm Patty Satalia, and this is Conversations Live. Get your garden on on WPSU-TV and WPSU-FM. Let me reintroduce our guests. Tom Butzler <clears throat> is a Penn State Extension horticulture educator in Clinton County. Mike Orzelik is a professor of vegetable crops in the Department of Horticulture at Penn State. And Steve Bogart is a Penn State Extension horticulture educator in Franklin County. Our telephone number is 1-800-543-8242 and our panelists are ready to take your call. You can also email your question to connect at WPSU.org. If you'd like to join us on Twitter, you can tweet a question to at WPSU. And I also want to remind you to take a look at our website, WPSU.org slash conversations live for links to our three minute gardener videos as well as resources on tonight night's topic. And we go to uh, Jackie, who's been waiting patiently on the line in Altoona. Go ahead, please, Jackie. It was worth the wait. <laughs> um, last summer or uh, spring, I planted two uh, hellebores plants, and they were supposed to be red. They bloomed this year, and they're both purple. Um, what I'm wondering is if is, if altering the pH of the soil that you were talking about earlier would have any effect on the color like it does like hydrangeas and stuff. Uh, Hellbores are not, they're, they're, one, they're outside of my loop. Yeah, I, I know what they look like. I, I don't know the culture on those. So, Jackie, uh, we'll ha probably have to get back to you on that one or yeah. call your um, local extension office. You're correct, and with the hydrangeas, you can modify that right, flower right. color by manipulating that soil pH. But I'm not sure about that. So, good question. All right, mm -hmm. and... And extension offices are located in every county. We have a map that we'll put up that will uh, provide a website address for, uh, for your county extension office, uh, extension.psu.edu slash counties, and you can find the one closest to you. Thank you for that call. We go to Richie, who's calling us from Myersdale. You're on the air, Richie. Hello, guys. Um, I've, I've planted a mini orchard with plums, pears, and apples, about five trees apiece. And I'm noticing a black caterpillar with a yellow stripe that I'm constantly, every single day, having to remove off the leaves. They're kind of like eating at the leaves. Um, I'm trying not to use any chemical pesticides because I'd like to stay as organic as possible. What could I do as a home remedy to uh, just to either divert these caterpillars or get rid of them altogether? Do you recognize which caterpillar he's talking about? Not offhand, but I've learned that when folks call and they say, I've got this bug, it's one of the toughest things to do. But they're caterpillars, so you're looking for an organic remedy. Um, if they're not too old, if they're still young, you can use um, a product called Bacillus, um, Bacillus thuringiensis. You'll find it as Dipel or Thuricide. Um, it's an organic product. It's usable as organic. It's a bacteria. You'll spray it on. The caterpillars will eat it, um, and it will kill them over time. And that's probably about the best organic control for caterpillars. Otherwise, you have the other one. You're picking them off. What an excellent way to get rid of them. Richie, it sounded like you were trying to tell us something else. Yeah, I'm picking them off now but because the trees are saplings. They're only 7 feet tall, but once they get about 10, 12, 13 feet, it's going to be very difficult. What, what, what? Type, what type of rootstock do you have? Is that a uh, standard rootstock or is that a, a dwarf? Uh, I believe they're standard. They're standard. They okay. say they get to be, tw uh, maybe they are the 25 feet tall yeah. they get to be. Yeah, they'll be standard. Uh, uh, Steve alluded to a, a good point there is that trying to identify an insect just by verbal description from a homeowner can be somewhat um, hard to do. Uh, for example, today someone called in with a bug insect problem and they were, they thought they had a bronze marmorated stink bug. And as I told them the description of it, it didn't fit. And so I said, take a picture of it and email it to me. And it was a, a wood cockroach. Oh my so the description, I mean, it was, it was, you know, we weren't connecting there until that picture was sent. So, you know, one thing you could do is if you have a digital camera, um, take a picture of it and um, you know, send it to one of the uh, uh, county offices right. or the county office that you're in. And typically, um, most of us are pretty well trained if we see it visually. I mean, we got it right there. Sure. All right. You brought up the, thank you for your call, Richie. You brought up the, the stink <clears throat> bug, uh, which was introduced, first introduced, I, I understand, into Allentown, Pennsylvania, um, and is now, it was, you know, it's been invading households, but it's also becoming an agricultural pest, affecting peaches and, and apple orchards. What can you tell us about it? How do you, how can we... I think that's more of a problem down your way. I mean, yeah. we have it up here, but I think, Steve, you're kind of at the 
brunt of it. Last year we got lucky. Last season it was it was not the big deal it was the year before. We just don't know enough about it. There's a lot of research going on right now at Penn State <clears throat> and other institutions. Best thing to do is keep your eyes open for it. Um, the class of insecticides known as uh, pyrethroids, they've, they've been the most effective for it. Um, but we may not, they may not be a big deal this year. They weren't last year. Well, last year they were saying they had no natural enemies. Right. And, and in the house, they're suggesting you vacuum them up, not, not use insecticides. Except, you know, when you vacuum them, there's a reason that they're called stink bugs. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they, they, they got that apparent. reason honestly. They got that, they got that name honestly. But there are some natural enemies. Um, there's a wasp, a sand wasp that will feed on it. Um, so there are a few. Um, it's not, it's, all hope is not lost at this point. We, no. We've been through new pests in Pennsylvania pretty often. We'll get through this one also. It, again, last year was not nearly as bad as we expected it to be. How does something like the stink bug make its way from Asia to Pennsylvania? We buy a lot of goods from <laughs> Asia. We send stuff there, they send stuff back. All you need is a pregnant female, and we have a new population. Mm -hmm. Well, changing lots of things, isn't it? Uh, we go to Mary Jane from Rowlett, and I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Tell me if I'm not. That's right. Oh, good. What's your question, please, Mary Jane? I have a maple tree out here in the yard, and I put some of that red bark around it. And uh, I wondered if that's what, and it died. It's about 10 years old. All but one limb on it died. And I wondered if it was that bark that I put around it that caused it. Mary Jane, I'm not sure. When you're saying you put red bark around it, what... The, the what, rubber mulch? You, you're talking about mulch around the base of it, or you put... Yeah, put, around the base of it, that red mulch. Was it dyed mulch. red uh, mulch? Huh? It, if it's red, was it probably dyed? Yeah, yeah. it probably yeah. was. Yeah. Um, Probably was. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think so. I mean, those that mulch has undergone testing, and, and they've trialed it out at other places. So chances are that it's not a result of that um, material that you use. Right. You know, it, it was 10 years old. Sometimes um, uh, when plants are produced, um, they may be planted too deep in a container, and then when you plant it, you plant it even deeper. So, you know, it takes a couple years for that plant to die. Yep. Uh, so that could be an issue. Um, I mean, there's, there's a multiple, multitude of factors. Um, you know, sometimes with homeowners, we see where they've applied lawn herbicides, and mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, some of that's gone on to the broadleaf plants, whether they're perennials or uh, woody plant material. So that could be an issue. But I don't think it was the mulch. I don't think no, it was I don't that think mulch. So either. I agree. Okay. Yeah. Um, she I bring... got mulch around other trees, and they haven't died. But yeah. Benton did. Okay, so it sounds like they're they're probably right, right that it was some wasn't, other mitigating the factor yep. there. Yep. Don't don't go and replant a maple back in well, that spot. That's a good point because um, oh, right. what you're describing is a is a disease called verticillium wilt, which is common in maples, and Goes you would the roots. yeah you would be very poorly served putting a mm -hmm. maple back in that same spot. Good that's point. What I was going to do. I'm glad you told me. Thank you for your phone call. Companion planting is, is important. So what you plant next to can affect, for instance, uh, I have uh, walnut trees in my backyard and lots of things, everything I have learned from mm. experience, everything I planted next to it died. Right. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about companion planting? You can actually plant things that are good for each other or... or no. I, you know, there, there are some things, there are some combinations at work. Um, one of the ones that I had heard about for a long time is you put um, marigolds all around your tomatoes because they will, they will keep the pests out of the tomatoes. What I found is that my marigolds got loaded full of Japanese beetles first <laughs> and then they ate everything else. So companion planting can work. There's a lot of good books on it out there. Um, I think you're a lot better off to get the soil ready, get the pH right, get the fertility right, put healthy plants in. You're going to be way ahead of the game. All right. We go now to uh, an email. This one from Curtis in Spring Mills. Is aluminum sulfate okay to use to reduce <clears throat> soil pH for blueberries? <clears throat> Any special considerations if using this? I understand it gives more rapid pH changes than many other amendments. This is kind of an easy one. If you know your starting pH, then you know how much to apply. It's a combination of the age of the blueberry and the pH that you're trying to work towards. So again, if you've got a soil test, you have an idea where you're going. Yep. There's no problem with using the product, but the rate of nitrogen, which is what you're using that product for, the rate of it has to do with how old the plant are. And there are some really good published scales that tell you how much to use for how old the plant is and for the pH that you're trying mm -hmm. to go 
going for. Good product to use, it's gonna get you where you want, but if you're at a pH of like 7.5 and you're heading for somewhere between 4.5 and 5, this is not gonna be enough. It's just one step in the right direction. He may wanna use flowers of sulfur. For long-term stuff. Yeah. Say that again, yeah. Mike. Flowers of sulfur, it's actually pure sulfur, and when you apply it to the soil, it really drops the pH rather quickly. <clears throat> Okay, and you need to maintain that pH all year round, even even in the winter. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. uh, we go to Shirley, who's calling us from Bedford. Go ahead, please, Shirley. Uh, I have an overabundance of horseradish in our garden. We started out with a couple stalks, <laughs> and it's just taking over the garden. And I was wondering how uh, we could get rid of it. Make more processed horseradish. <laughs> You're not making nearly enough of the stuff. You get, need to get more vinegar, more jars. Um, the problem is when you're digging, you're leaving little pieces behind. That's, that's where it's spreading from. Mm -hmm. So the most important thing is, is when you dig horseradish, you want to dig a bigger hole, take out more stuff, uh, make sure you're getting every little root. When I, I work with a couple growers who grow large quantities of horseradish, and it's amazing how small of a root they start from every year. So when you dig, Dig, dig more fully and keep at it. Every time you see a sprig sprouting, dig that out. Over time, you will win this battle. Yeah. And the other option would be if you don't want to do a lot of digging, but you have horseradish as a volunteer coming up in your garden, just mow it. Mow it once a week. Yep. As long as you starve that plant from getting carbohydrates, you're going to kill it eventually. But if you've got horseradish, you need roast beef. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we have another email. This one from Jim. My sweet autumn clematis seems healthy but no aroma. I've been told to buy new sweet autumn clematis that has been bred for aroma. How do I find such seeds? Uh, a florist I know is selling me what is bred for aroma as opposed to what is bred for appearance. I think we had a similar. I think we had a similar question like that. And you know, flowers and ornamentals are bred for two multiple reasons. Some are bred for their very showy flower characteristics, and you know, with a trial garden, Don Atlanta's filled with the flowers. That's what they're mainly looking at. And others are bred for their um, their scent. So you just have to open the catalogs, and most of them are very descriptive. Yep. Um, so I, I'd either go online. There's you know a bunch of online catalogs or some of the mail order ones, um, and just browse through that. Okay. I want to ask one quick question, Tom, because earlier you were talking about transplanting and that one of the mistakes we make is that uh, we, we plant a tree too deep. A lot of people will be transplanting trees right now or planting trees for the first time. What, how should you properly uh, dig and plant a, a tree for success? Well, <clears throat> if you ever look at a tree, um, it, you have the trunk coming down and then it flares out at the very bottom. It's what we call the root flares. So you want to, when you plant, you want to be able to see those, those root flares. Sometimes people, I guess, think that uh, their, their roots, their actual roots, and so they'll dig deep and then just really plop cover it. it. Yeah, you know, really cover it. And, what, and then you get this, what we call the telephone, uh, telephone pole effect, where you have this tree that's just going straight down into the soil. And that bark, um, right above that root flare, um, it, either of all the created, however you want to look at it, it's not supposed to be wet and moist and it's supposed to be out there in the open air. So it, sometimes homeowners dig, or dig the hole too deep, bury it, and then just throw that dirt not on top. Not only too deep, but not big enough, right? Ball, ball Wide and, enough. Ball and burlap, what's your recommendation? On, what do you mean? Ball and burlap trees that you're buying at the nursery. Get the burlap. Well, I mean, you can buy trees a couple different ways. You can buy them um, as a bare root, and typically that's your mail order, and they're, they're cheaper because you don't yeah. have all that weight. Uh, and then you have these container-grown plants, and they're nice because you can kind of move them around all season long. Um, and, you know, they're, they're produced in a nursery, whereas your ball and burlap, um, you know, they've got to dig those in the spring, and once spring's over, they really can't dig those anymore. They can dig them in the fall, going into fall. But uh, the ball and burlap, uh, most of the roots are left behind when they are dug. Most of the roots are still in the soil. So, I mean, they, they all have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, so... If you've got a strong back, Mike, go with the, uh, with the ball, ball and burlap. burlap. Um, they're heavy. Most of the roots are left behind, but it, 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 the way they prune them in the nursery, that root ball does still contain a lot of feeder roots, and it can take pretty well. And it, it's important with bald and burlap that you want to remove all the burlap. Mm -hmm. If there's a wire cage there, it'll rust in the ground, but way too slowly. A lot of times the tree roots will expand too quickly and they'll get tangled up with that. So the wire cage comes off, all the burlap comes off, all the string comes off, and you want to set it a little high. You're better off a little high mm -hmm. than, than too, too deep. Yeah, we refer to too deep as burial, and we, we plant plants, we don't bury them. Okay, we go to Paul from Clearfield. Go ahead, please, Paul. 
Yeah, so I'm very interested in uh, produce. Uh, I'm presently growing some produce, and I was wondering if there's any studies at Penn State that uh, is studying the formerly mined areas in Clearfield County and other counties to grow produce or other items like produce. If you could uh, give me an answer on that, please, and I thank you. I, I know there's a lot of work on reclamation right. um, of, of these sites, but not for vegetable production. I, I think it's mostly like uh, woody material. Yeah, they're uh, usually looking for very specific plants that will take certain yeah. minerals out of the soil. You know, with tomatoes, um, peppers, eggplant, y most folks are trying to give it ideal conditions, and I think a reclamation site is probably the opposite of ideal conditions. There's a lot of things that have to happen before you're going to go putting produce on there. Well, the only way you could do it is you made raised beds. Yep. And you yeah. bring in soil and put it into the raised bed, and then you maybe put some uh, weed barrier cloth on the bottom so you don't get many roots going down into that to reclaim soil. But you could do it, but it's a little effort. Yeah. All right. Anna in Bedford, what's your question, please? Uh, my yard, I have somebody that takes care of it and puts fertilizer on it, but it gets red spots. Uh, in it, and they tell me there isn't anything that can be put on to take care of it. Now, I put um, weed killer and fertilizer on in the spring, and then I put the grub worm on, and then I put fertilizer for the fall. But the red spots are coming right now. I didn't know if you knew anything to take care of them or not. Well, I, just by the description, I would say red thread. Yep. Um, yeah. It's a disease that occurs on, on our cool season grasses. Um, I mean, you, you can apply a fungicide to it, but typically I have never seen it spread uh, mm -hmm. in, in large right. areas. Um, you'll see it in lawns that are fertilized on a regular basis. Yeah. So, I mean, one of your options is maybe to pull back on the, the fertilizer applications. Um, the other is to just let it run its course. Once it kind of warm, starts warming up, that's going to be done and over with. Yep. So. Yep, yep. I don't need to worry that it's going to make my whole yard look red. No, no, I've never seen I've never seen a, hard, a yard turn red. Although it'd be kind of unique. I mean, I, I mean, <laughs> being an oddity, and It'd you be can different. Invite yeah. the neighbors over yeah. and look at it. Uh huh. So, uh, but no, it won't. It should not be a problem for you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, thank Anna, you. for your phone call. We go to Edward. He's calling us from Johnstown. Go, uh, go ahead, please, Edward. Edward, are you there? We'll go to Joanne from State College and come back to Edward if we can get him on the line. Joanne from State College. Hello there. Um, I tuned in late, uh, and I, if you have not already, could you address, could you refresh me on hardening off plants that uh, have been raised inside, indoors? Oh sure, that's a that's a lot of fun to do. Um, the the biggest the biggest thing is temperature and intense sunlight. You know, you've I'm assuming that you've raised them under grow lights. Is that correct? Um, yeah. Okay, so they they're, they're going to get a lot more solar radiation when you move them outside. Um, I would put them in an area that's got dappled sunlight where it doesn't get the full morning to evening sun for the first couple days. Um, the the temperatures at night right now. I'm I'm from the Carlisle area. We had a low last night that was in the mid 40s. That's a little cool for plants that are first out. So probably a night like that, you take them back in again. But after a couple days out um, and the dappled sunlight, move them to full sunlight, and within a week they'll be easily hardened off and ready to go. Really, it, hardening off, you're just getting them used to being outdoors. You've kind of coddled them inside. You know, it's 65 to 75 indoors. You've given them everything ideal. Now they've got to get used to being outdoors. So just get them out there. But the first couple days out especially, don't just leave them out in the sun from the sun up to sun down. You may barbecue your plants. Yeah. Sunburn. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Joanne. Good question. Uh, Jim from Brockway, you're on the air. Hello. I wanted to ask you about cigarettes and tobacco. Are they bad to have around your garden for would, would they spread something to tomatoes? Yes, they will. Actually, cigarettes is a prime uh, vector for tobacco mosaic virus. Wow. And I remember when I was at University of Maryland, we had actually a professor who was smoking and working with tomatoes. I says, why? Because he always would find virus in his plants. And so if, you, if you're working around tomatoes especially, do not smoke do, and wash your hands right away if you do smoke. 
to prevent the uh, vectoring of tobacco mosaic virus in your plants. Well, yeah. that's a new one. Yeah, the big, the big problem is the smoke is not hot enough to kill the virus particles, so they, they come off on the smoke and settle on plants. In your hands, too. In your hands, yeah, in your too, hands yeah. As you're smoking, yep. yep. Well, that, that's one more reason to quit smoking, though. You're smoking <laughs> something right. that has a yeah. virus. Killing your tomato plants. <laughs> All right. Uh, we have an email, this one from Barbara in State College. Is there any food crop that I can grow in my yard which is heavily shaded by black walnut trees? Mm. You might be able to go, grow some greens in the middle of the summertime. Um, I'm assuming that you have sun, su some sunlight, and in the middle of the summertime, you could possibly grow some of the bolt-resistant lettuces like uh, Jericho and things like that. Don't expect a whole lot. All, all the vegetables like a lot of sunlight. And the walnut tree is not exactly a favorite thing for well, most plants. Well, yeah. I, would grow I would grow them in pots. I would grow them in or, pots or with a good potting bed. media or raised bed. Yeah, the, 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 the jugglings from the black walnuts mm -hmm. is not helping you any, right. but use your sunniest spot put things in raised beds or containers and give them a try like that. Okay, give us a couple of tips on container gardening. Oh, I love container gardening. That's, um, we have a big research project that's been ongoing at the Landisville Farm on that. Um, the most interesting part is one of the oldest container ver uh, varieties, Bush Early Girl, has been one of our best varieties. It's been around forever. Mike, I mean, you, I'm sure you've known this it's one probably for- Probably 60 years. Yeah, and it, it is awesome in container. You can put it in a 14 or 16 inch pot and it will give you 20 or 30 pounds of really, truly delicious fruit every year. Wow. And then there's a lot of other wonderful varieties we've got reports on. And, and those reports can be found on your website? They at can the, be uh, found at the, at the Penn State Gardens? website, yep. All right, okay. We go to Charles, who's calling us from Williamsport. You're on the air, Charles. Well, I planted some sunflower seeds inside, and they grew to about eight inches, and I took them and transplanted them outside, and they're still splitting. And I just wonder what uh, what what's the problem there? They're still they're, they're, they're still growing. Well, they, you want them growing. Uh, what what kind of what variety of sunflowers were they? First off. Oh, I don't know. They okay. Grew. Well, uh, sunflowers they're supposed to grow to twelve feet. Oh, okay. So they were mammoth Russian mm -hmm. sunflowers. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, they should have only been in the little pots indoors for maybe 20 days before you got them out. So if the problem is is that you grew them in pots longer than that, that could be all, by, they'll, they'll get very root tangled very quickly and mm -hmm. that'll be a problem. Um, what I would do, and this sounds like a lot like our cantaloupe caller earlier, is just replant them outdoors. They're gonna come and with, within three weeks, you'll have brand plant new seeds, ones up. Plant seeds, plant seeds, yeah. Seed. Forget the plants. Yeah. Right, this was... yeah, you did a good experiment. <laughs> um, if you do it next year, count 20 days back from the day you wanna plant right. out and start them indoors. But sunflowers, sweet corn, cantaloupes, cucumbers, they just don't have very much time in the pot before you have to get them out. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Thank Pleasure. you Thank for you. your phone call. You know, lots of people have leftover seed from last <laughs> year. What's your advice in terms of whether to use it or not use it? And is there a way to, to, to determine before you go to all the trouble of putting it in your garden if it's going to germinate or not? Well, you can easily do a germination test at home. Just take a paper towel, wet it up real well, and put some seeds in there, maybe 10 seeds and see what happens and stay in about uh, seven to ten days. I would put it in a, a room of the house which is probably like 70, 70 degrees during the day, maybe 50 at night. And that's a good temperature to get germination of most seeds. And just count how many you have. If you only have two seeds out of ten, don't bother. it's not worth it. But if you're getting eight or nine seeds out of ten, that's worth replanting again. Okay. Uh, Tad from Center Hall, you're on the air. Yes, hello. Uh, it seems like uh a lot of people are talking about black walnut and uh, trees and their effects on plants. I have a question. Um, if there's topsoil that's been around black walnuts and you move it somewhere else to put it into a garden, um, how long does the toxin last? Uh, how long does that effect last on other plants that you might try to plant there? That's a really good question. Uh, it is. I, you know, I, th I think after, if you just move the soil and there's not any roots in there, I think after maybe a growing season, you know, after you have rainfall and, and, and snow, some of those toxins would, would leach out because I think the, the biggest problem is with the with the roots right. still even if the tree's dead the, those roots are still right, secreting right. that toxin. I, um, so I had a greenhouse grower several years ago take a soil that had some black walnut roots in it and it took them two years to get the juggling effect out. But the roots were still in that soil. Yeah, right. yeah. So. But I, I, the problem would be getting all those roots out mm -hmm. and even the you know the small fine roots right. you may easily over. Yeah, and they're going to break down those. fast. Yeah. Yep. 
All right. Hope that answers your question. We go to Jim, who's calling us from uh, Carrolltown. Go ahead, please, Jim. Yeah, my question is uh, I have plants, broccoli and cabbage and uh, uh, some tomato plants that I set outside, and some of them, they turn white. The leaves turn white, and uh, the plants die. And some of them, they turn white, and then they come back. But my question is, uh, is it because of the sun or because I set them out and it's too cold? Uh, could you answer that, please? Yeah, you're, you're <laughs> typically what you're, you're seeing is the fact that you're taking a plant from inside going, as Steve alluded to earlier, and you're putting it outside. And when you get a plant that was inside under artificial lighting and put into full sun, uh, we typically see the leaves start to turn white because they get sunburned, sun bleached, mm -hmm. and... Um, depending on the degree of sun burning, sun bleaching, some may come back, some will just totally die. But you have to do it in uh, progressive steps, and so you want to do it, you know, maybe you put these plants in the sunlight for maybe three, four hours a day. And you said dappled sunlight in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. yep. And then uh, as you, after maybe, by, as Steve said, about a week, then you can actually put in full sunlight without any type of pro a problem of getting injury to it. All right. Thank you for your phone call. We go to an email, this one from Carl. I use compost that is provided by the center region in my vegetable plots. The compost is made from leaves and grass cuttings. How worried should I be about lawn pesticide residues in the compost? I think a lot of people are concerned about that. Yeah, uh, that is... I that was a problem in the past. I think the, um, uh, there were some uh, herbicides that were used in lawn care, mm -hmm. and uh, these lawn cl uh, clippings were taken to a site, and then people would uh, pick them up and take them back to the vegetable gardens. I don't think those products are um, allowed to be used on residential lawns anymore, if I recall correctly. The only problem you may run into is um, some of these commercial-type operations, uh, um, golf courses. They, they still use some of those herbicides. But do their sure. clippings end up in the center region? I, I, that I don't know. Yeah. Probably not. Th right. I, that I don't know. But I do think some of those um, residential herbicides that presented some of these problems in, I think it was peppers or tomatoes a couple years back, I don't believe they're um, for, for use on home lawns anymore. I mean, it, it's always possible that the compost does have some pesticides in it. Um, you're, if you're using it in your vegetable garden, you're going to know. The, the tomatoes, uh, I, I refer to them as the canary in the coal mine. They will, you'll get curled leaves and thickened leaves if, if, there are, if those kind of residues are there. If the tomato plants are growing normally, you have very little to be concerned about. All right. Thank you for your call. Uh, we go to <clears throat> Doris, who's calling us from McVeigh Town. Go ahead, please, Doris. I would like to know what I can do to keep robins from building a nest in my hanging basket. <laughs> <laughs> build, a, build a robin uh, house, <laughs> birdhouse next to it. <laughs> um, robins, robins will build nests in all kinds mm -hmm. of crazy places. At our house, we have a spider web trellis that our clematis is on. And we have robins every year. We had the, I think the, the current nest is about 8 or 10 inches deep because they keep layering on it. We keep taking it down. They keep rebuilding it. The only thing I can suggest to you is you be more um, pushy than they are. When you see the nest starting, take it out. Over time, they will move. Right, and, and water. If you, if you continue to water, the birds sometimes don't come back. So okay. we go. All right, good luck with that. Uh, Annette from Lyleville, you're on the air. Hello? Hi, do you have a question for us? Um, yes, I have a greenhouse where I grow my own plants. I start them from seeds. And I've got four different tomato plants going. And <clears throat> my beefsteak, my Roma, and my early girl are all doing good. But my cherry tomatoes have black spots all over them. And I'm worried that it might be blight. Now, can blight only attack one type of tomato plant and not <clears throat> the others? Well, they, there are variable sensitivities to it. Um, whether you have earlier early blight or septoria leaf spot, kind of hard to say from the description, but there is wide variability, um, different sensitivities to different diseases. I would, I would go, if you've got a greenhouse full of them and they're important to you, you probably ought to start using some kind of a preventative fungicide program on them. Um, and if you, uh, if you don't mind going with chemicals, you could look at something like Mancozeb. That would give you good control. Um, if you're looking for something more organic, think Regalia, Stimplex, and Copper. 
they'd all give you some measure of control. My, my guess is you're looking at Septoria leaf spot, though. It, it'd be good to get verification before yeah. you start applying the fungicides, yep. too. And plant disease clinic might be one place you could send them. Could yep. be bacterial leaf spot, too. Yeah, it okay. certainly is possible, yep. yep. Okay, so positive identification sounds, sounds like the first thing you want to find out. Thank you, Annette, so much for your phone call. Uh, we're about to wrap things up, but I wanted to, to end with this. You guys must learn something new every year, and, and I'm just wondering, what's the best new tip you can share with our audience tonight? Oh, um, so <laughs> I was going there so much. Um, <laughs> Last year, um, we did uh, the, the disease control program that we used in uh, my high tunnel at the uh, Landisville farm. We used a combination of Regalia and Stimplex, which are, Regalia is a giant knotweed extract and, sti and Stimplex is a seaweed extract. We had an incredible level of disease control in our tunnel with those products. They fit under an organic program. And what I love about them is we can spray them and go right back to work again. So that was kind of a, a new slant on it. And those are relatively new materials that are going to be relatively available to homeowners very shortly. And again, that's on your website? Yes. Okay. Tom? Uh, I guess the thing, I, I, you're right with the job. We do learn a lot every year. And the one thing that I learned new this year or was exposed to was uh, the sea corn maggot on onions. I had never seen it as bad this year as in previous years. Uh, some of our growers went in <clears throat> early and the um, maggot was there waiting for it. And it, it did pretty good damage to, to the onion crop. Mike? I think the one thing I've learned in the last couple of years is that if I'm making a raised bed with plastic and drip, I turn my drip on immediately and then after I have it running for four or five, six hours, then I go and transplant. If you transplant that bed without water, you tend to lose a lot of, a lot of plants. All it's right. too dry. Uh, thanks to Tom Butzler, Mike Orzelak, and Steve Bogash. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, reminder to check out our website, wpsu.org slash conversations live. You'll find links to our three-minute gardener videos as well as resources on tonight's topic. Thank you all so much for watching and listening. I'm Patty Satalia. For all of us here at WPSU, have a good night.